everybody and welcome to this video where we are going to talk about the keyword rephrase in Swift. So rephrase, I think it's one of those keywords from Swift that probably you've already seen it maybe when you call function from the Swift standard library, like calling the function map for instance, but there is also a fair chance that you never actually had the need to use it in your own code. And maybe you're not very sure about what it does or how it can be used. So in this video, we are going to take an example and see how we can use rephrase. And I've just said that you might have read the keyword rephrase when using the function map. So our example is that we are going to try and re-implement a version of map and see when the need to use rephrase arise. So I'm going to begin by pasting in some code. So you can see here I've pasted an extension of sequence and in this extension I have implemented a new version of map. So I called it map2 so as to avoid the naming conflicts. And the implementation, while it's pretty straightforward, it's what we could call a naive implementation of map in the sense that it takes a closure as an argument. This closure can transform an element of the sequence into a generic type t. And then inside the function, while well, we declare an array of type t, we iterate over the element of the sequence. For each element, while well, we transform it using the function we got as an argument, then we append the transform value to the array. And finally, in the end, we return the array. So I say that this is a naive implementation of map because, well, if you were to look at the real implementation of map in the library, you would see that there is a lot more optimization made in order to deal with array allocation and array capacities. Here we're just focusing on what map does, which is transforming the elements of a sequence into a new type. So now let's try and use this map function. So once again, I'm going to paste in some code. You can see first I've pasted here an array of integers, which is my data. And then I have here a function called transform. It takes an int and turns it into a string and it does so by using string interpolation. Pretty straightforward. And now well, what we can do is that on data, since data is an array, it is also a sequence, so we can call the function map2. And then inside the function, well, we can just call our transform function. And so this way we are using map2 to iterate over a sequence and transform all of its elements using the function transform. Okay, pretty simple. Now let's complexify this function transform a little bit. And let's make it so that it can throw errors. So first we need an error type. So I'm going to make a type called random error and we'll see why I call it this way. So it's an enum, I make it conform to the protocol error and I'm going to put just a single case there called random error. Okay, now what I want to do is that in my function, well, I'm going to test a random Boolean value. If the Boolean is true, well, I'm going to do just like before, just return the transformed value. But when the Boolean is false, well, I'm just going to throw An error. So as you can see here, half the time the function will work as expected and half the time it will throw an error at random, hence the name random error. So now I need to mark my function as throwing. Okay, perfect. Now, however, we can see here that there is a compilation error. And that's normal because when we want to call a function that can throw, well, we need to mark it with try. All right, so we mark it with try. But then we again have an error because, well, my function map2 here, it expects a non-throwing function. I am passing in a throwing function. So once again, I need to make adaptations. So here, I need to mark the function given as an argument to map2 as throwing. I need to mark the call of this function with try. And finally, well, I need to also mark the function map2 as throwing because it can throw an error if here the call to transform throws an error. And finally, here at my call site of map2, well, I also must add the keyword try. So now everything is working as expected. Map2 is able to deal with functions that return errors, so that's all well. But let's try and see something. Let's say that now I want to call map2, but with a non-throwing function. So for instance, I'm going to give it a closure that just returns its argument. So basically the identity function. Well, now you can see that I have an error in says, call can throw but is not marked with try. So the compiler wants me to mark my call to map2 with a try. And it makes sense for the compiler because let's look at it here, map2 is marked as throwing. However, well, we can see here that the closure we give it as an argument cannot throw. So this try here, well, it feels really like superfluous. So what we would actually like to have is a mechanism where if we pass in to map2 a closure that can throw, well, of course, then we need to annotate the call to map2 with try. However, when we pass in a function that doesn't throw, well, we would like not to have to mark the call to map2 with try because here this try is completely superfluous and is going to make our code much more complicated without any real need. 
So as you can imagine from the title of the video, well, this is where refroze is going to come into play. So on my function map here, I'm going to change the second froze and change it with refroze. And now you can see that the code still builds. However, I have a warning that now tells me, well, using try here is superfluous because I am not calling a throwing function. So I can remove this try and you can see now that refers well, it implements just the behavior that I described early on, meaning that when we pass in a closure that can throw to map to, well, we need to, of course, mark the call to map to with try because the function map to is going to refrow the error thrown by its closure. However, when the closure cannot throw, well, we don't need to bother about annotating the call with try because the compiler can infer that indeed when calling map2 with a non-throwing argument, map2 itself will never throw. So that's how you can use refers in Swift. What we've seen is that it's a mechanism that allows us whenever we take in as argument a function, if this function can throw, well, the calling function will be able to refer the error, but the Swift compiler is also going to make it easy for us, meaning that we won't have to annotate call that can never throw. So as always, if you find the content of the video useful, where well, you can give a like. If you have already used Refos or if you have any question about it, you can say it in the comments and you can subscribe for more content or share the video around if you think that your colleagues could use it. Thank you.